Both cases that are complicated care. If you find a baby that has a club foot, well, the baby is a club foot, and that's it. You look at the spine also, but that's a very simple case. But what do you do when you have a more complicated case? So this is what we're going to be looking at. So I have divided this. I think my boss is running out of battery. Uh, we're going to divide this into four uh, segments. And then we'll skip a lot of this to just show you most of the images. So first is finding the findings. And this is a sentence from Rolf Walter Emerson that we use in the previous that, which is, people only see what they prefer to see. And this is very true. If you don't know what you're going to be looking at on the image, it is very easy to miss the, the findings. So here's a case, and I'm going to show you five images. And I want you to tell yourself what is abnormal on these images. They're the first two images, and the next three images. OK? Alparacil, I can hear. So we have a soft tissue mass in front of the abdomen, and the most likely diagnosis here is alparacil. However, could it be gastroschisis? No, because gastroschisis would have irregular edges. Now, what is this thing here? Yeah, bone. So, any any of you has seen on fantasy with bones? Mm -hmm. Look at this here. Any any of fantasy with bones? And here, this looks like a cross section for leg. So now we have an unfair seal that has legs. Anyone seen that? No. This is what this baby has. This is the baby, and this is what it has. You see? So, what is that? A conjoint twin, a teratoma, or epigastrius? Epigastrius. This is what it is. This is the epigastrius or heteroparagetic twin. This is an example from Ambroise Pache. You see the head attached to the other person. This is one from India, which is almost the same. This is a, a little boy that has a brother attached to himself. This one had arms, and ours did not have arms. And this one is from Bartholinius, you know, the guy from the gland. And this is the opposite. Here we have a head, but no, no limbs. And then this is one which I think is very interesting. This is a, a French one. Uh, she was called the four-legged lady, and she was born in 1869. Just we have seen in the previous lecture, in 1869 there was no medicine, there was almost nothing. In particular, there were no proteins, protein had not been recognized, and hormones had not been recognized. And the doctor who looked at this uh, person found that the legs were peeing independently from the uh, host, but they were menstruating at the same time. So he postulated that there was a central regulation for menstruation and a local mechanical regulation for urination. I think this was a very interesting example of a birth defect that helps solve some issue of physiology. So the teaching point here is do not jump to conclusion when diagnosing something familiar, because otherwise you have to explain the extra finding instead of putting the findings directly into the image. Another case here. Here we have five babies that have a full stomach. So what's the diagnosis? Do not treat them. Okay. So if you think do not treat them, you are 20% correct. This one baby here has do not treat them. Now, how about this one here? Why is this not due to nutrition? You see the double bubble, you see the polyhydramus, why is this not due to nutrition? Compare this one to this one. Look how big the stomach here, big the duodenum is. This is a condition called a combined duodenal and esophageal atresia. So nothing can enter the stomach, nothing can exit the stomach. What's inside the stomach? Okay. Gastric secretion, hepatic secretion. Okay? So this baby gets a very large stomach, much bigger than in duodenal because in duodenal if the baby drinks too much, 
you will vomit. Just like when you have baby, you have to burn them, otherwise they're going to vomit. Same thing happened in general treasure, which is the reason you see the esophagus of this baby better than other babies. So this is combined you know, is a visual treasure. How about this one here? Why is this not general treasure? What is missing in that baby? How about the amniotic fluid? Can you have dual treasure without polyhydrogenous? Yes or no? No. The only time you get dual treasure with no polyhydrogenous is when the mother just ruptured her membranes. And then she will tell you, I, I was doing some shopping and I ruptured my membranes. So this is something. This here is called dual stenosis. This is an obstruction of the duodenum but it's not a complete obstruction, so that fluid can pass. This is a different thing. Here, this is pyloric web. This is a uh, very static way of going for the stomach. Now, this baby here has something very interesting. It looks exactly like duodenotresia. It's almost the same thing, but it's a different etiology. This baby has an angular pancreas. So if you remember, in embryology, you have a ventral enlarge and a dorsal enlarge and they rotate so that they merge together. If they rotate the other direction, then the ventral enlarge is going to squeeze the duodenum and you get this uh, image over here. This is an angular pancreas. Now, interestingly, duodenal treasure, combined duodenal treasure, and angular uh, pancreas are all three associated with trisomy 21, okay? So, although it's tempting to jump to the first and the statistically most common diagnosis, this is called shooting from the hip in movies. Uh, you know, cowboys, they don't aim, they just shoot and then they look forward afterwards. We have a president in the United States that does that right now, too. Uh, so, in prenatal diagnosis, it's better to search for additional clues and then include differential diagnosis. Now, I'm going to show you a case here that has short limbs. And I want you to see what else than the short limbs is present. So look at the elbow of this baby, and the elbow has a particular area here. See that little horn here? And then I'm going to show you the knee of the baby. You see the knee also has a point at the end of the knee. And then I'm going to show you the ribs of the baby. And the ribs have something particular. It has macromedia and it has hypomineralization. If you see both ends of the ribs, it means the baby has uh, uh, hypomineralization. Let me show that to you. So when you look at a femur with ultrasound, you're not seeing the femur, you're just seeing the proximal cortical. You don't see the distal cortical because the proximal cortical absorbs all the ultrasound and then you have shadow behind it. So if you see the proximal cortical and the distal cortical, it means that there's not enough calcium in the bone. It's hypermineralized, and so then you can see both corticals. So this baby has short bones and hypermineralization. Now, what do we see at the elbow, and what do we see at the knee? Is this a fractured bone that goes through the skin, an exostosis, or a bony spur? Okay, so this is called a bony spur. Now, if you don't know what a bony spur is, you can go in OMIM. How many of you are using OMIM? Raise your hand. Any using OMIM? Okay, five. Oh, oh pretty good. Uh, about a quarter of you. Good. So, if you put bony spurs in OMIM, 
you have two differential diagnoses. Frontometer physical dysplasia, these are babies that have big super orbital ridges, and that's not what it is. And hyperphosphatasia infantile, and that's the diagnosis. So here, by having the right keyword, you go right to the correct diagnosis. Now the teaching point is, use the least common finding as your first search criteria. If you had been searching for uh, macromelia, there would be many different child diagnoses, but bony spur is the only one that is fitting here. Now the problem with that is that you have to have the right keyword, because if you put pointy elbow, you would not have any answer. So you have to have the right keyword, and that's the reason for reading as much literature as possible, because that's how you get to memorize all these names. Now, this is an ugly image that I'm going to skip over it, but there's an anomaly here that I want you to recognize. What's the anomaly in this picture? Where's the spine? The spine is here. This is apex. Which ventricle? Left ventricle. This one? Right ventricle. What is this vessel? This one? This one? And this one? Exactly. Very good. So this is a persistent left superior cava. And if you don't know how to look for a persistent superior cava, it's difficult to find. So let's see the what is the most significant finding. So when you have multiple findings, you have to do some search, and the best way to search is OMI. But which one is the most important keyword? So what you do is you find these findings by typing each of the keyword here and finding how many answers you get. So you put one keyword at, one at a time, count the number of return diagnoses, and then combine the keyword that have the least number of diagnoses. Let me show you an example. This is a series of pictures. I'm going to show you eight pictures. These are the first four. What is the anomaly of this baby? You can see four chamber, a flow track, three vessel view, a one. So the findings do not include a VSD, a thinking body, hyperplastic right ventricle, or overriding aorta. Well, we'll see in just a second. Boy or girl? Or ambiguous? Ambiguous. Okay? So here we have a VSD. The ballerina foot is broken, both riding aorta. And we have a small umrari and a large aorta. So VSD, overriding aorta. Tetra zero final. Okay, so the baby had to draw your blood, and the mother started crying and said, Oh, doctor, what's going to happen to my baby? And he went to say, Well, we have some cardiac surgeons here, and they can repair them, and the prognosis is going to be pretty much okay, or the prognosis is not very good. What do you tell her? Titrelagia failure is very common, huh? Most cardiac center can repair titrelagia failure. So you tend to say, Okay, it's pretty much okay. But remember, this baby has <coughs> ambiguous genitalia. Does a cardiac surgeon care about ambiguous genitalia? Probably not, huh? This is not his part of the body. What is this here? The eyes. What's wrong with the eyes? about the imaging fluid here? Normal or too bright? Too bright. Too bright because there is some particles or some blood or because the gain is too high? Yeah, the gain is too high here and the reason for that is he wanted to show this thing here. Yeah, what is that? 
hypertrichosis. These are chest hair. So this baby has hypertrichosis, chest hair, okay? You look for that when you scan? Now you look for that. So this baby has the trilogy for little and because the interior lung ash is hypertrichosis. Does it make a difference? How do we put this together? Well, we can go into OMIM and we can put Tetralogy of Fado, and there are 61 articles. That's a lot of time to worry that. So we need to make a shortcut. So let's put Tetralogy of Fado in neonates, and we have only one article. And this is the somebody that's hyperpenia, absent syndrome, the TAR syndrome. That's not all what this baby had. So this was wrong direction. We'll try something else. Let's try ambiguous genitalia, 62 article, too much. So what we're trying now, long eyelashes, 52 article, too many also. Put in neonate, oh now we have only four articles. That's something we can read. We can try also hypertrichosis, 67, too many. Hypertrichosis neonate, only four. So which criteria are you going to be using? Which keyword? Going to be using hypertrichosis and long eyelashes. Only six article, and if you put neonate, now we have only two article. That makes it quite easy. Now, which of these diagnoses is it? Cornelia de Norris syndrome. And if you click over here, you have a whole description of Cornelia de Norris syndrome. Now, that's interesting because this is what those babies look like. What's the prognosis for Cornelia de Norris syndrome? very poor, very mentally retarded, and so it is unlikely the cardiac surgeon is going to spend time on repairing the tetrasia of Fido for a baby that has such a poor outcome. So you see, if we had gone at the beginning and told the mother, oh, the baby has tetrasia of Fido, we can repair that, no big deal, well, we would have given her false hope. Now that we have the whole picture, we have a very different story. Now notice those babies have the eyebrows meeting in the middle. You see how they meet in the middle? Like this. Not in the little girl. Why not in the little girl? Because the mother don't like that, so they plug the hair in the middle. This is called a synophrys. So the teaching point here is when there are multiple findings, use the most discriminative. To find the most discriminative, look at the number of hits in OMIM and then combine those that have the fewest number of hits. Here's another difficult case. I want to see how many vessels are in the umbilical cord. This baby has to retrieve and I want to see how many vessels here. So it looks like one, it looks like two, it's not very sure. What do we do? We put cardopter. And when we put cardopter, how many cards do we see here? One or two? Two cards. A blue one and a red one. Okay? So the findings here is this image here, this color doctor, and this image here. So, is this a double umbilical vein? Yes, no? No, because they'll be the same color. Is this an arterial venous fistula with blood coming in one way, coming back the other way? Yes, no? It could be, but if it was an arterial venous fistula, there would be a lot of venous drainage and we don't see that, so probably not. Aneurysm of the vis of viscera, that doesn't exist, none of the above. So we have two vessels, they go in opposite direction, and this is interesting, look at this vessel here, it comes from the aorta and it goes straight into the umbilical cord. So here we have a very unusual vessel that got right out of the aorta and goes into the umbilical cord. So, this is what is called a replaced umbilical artery to the supramesentral artery. So normally we have two umbilical arteries going this way. This baby is missing one of these two umbilical artery, and his umbilical artery is arising from the supramesentral artery. So this is a fascinating point of embryology. Birds use the vitellin or umbilical arteries, but when we move from the yolk sac to using the placenta, we completely abandon that system and we move to the umbilical arteries. Now, 
This is a case in which there is a regression to a more primitive phylogenetic stage where the vitamin artery was the source of feeding for the embryo. And so what does this guy use? What is that? That's a platypus which they from Australia. And they have a beak and they lay eggs, but they are mammals. And so I tried to find what it was, what kind of vessel they had, but no one knew. Here is a series of video clips. And I want to know what that big cystic thing is. What is this here? Ovarian cysts, mesenteric cysts, obstructed bladder, or duplicated bowel. So, bladder obstruction. Let me explain that for you. It's a girl, has no one meeting fluid. So we know the cyst is the bladder because we have the umbilical arteries on one side. Any connection that has the umbilical arteries on one side has to be the bladder. There's nothing else again. No mesenteric cyst, no ovarian cyst, no nothing. So it's the bladder. So why do we have an obstructed bladder? We have, this is the list of potential obstruction. Post urethral valve, urethral genesis, major atresia, obstructive uterus seal, or the megacystis microcolon hyperatrocytic syndrome. So how do you select from that? Well, I was not very honest. I gave you the diagnosis of obstructive bladder, and that's not correct. And it's not correct because we have seen the amniotic fluid was normal. So it's not an obstructive bladder, it's a distended bladder. You see, I mean, fluid was normal. So, if it's not obstructed, if it's just distended, all these diagnoses don't work. It cannot be any of these. We don't see a ureter seal, so that's not possible either. So the only one possible is the megacystis microcolon hypophysis syndrome. So you tell that to the mother, so can we put a shot in my baby's bladder? I heard that in Denver they put some shunt in the bladder. Can we put a shunt in the bladder? Who wants to put a shunt? Who doesn't want to put a shunt? Who doesn't know whether to put or not to put? Okay. Well, what's in the name? Obstructed bladder versus distended bladder, or distended bladder versus subtractor? If you ask Julia, what difference does it make for the name? It makes a big difference because you go and do search in the wrong direction. So. You have to be precise in the terminology that you're using. So, this baby is going to die not from the obstruction of the bladder, she's going to die from the hypoparesis syndrome and the microcolon. So, there's no point in continuing pregnancy, there's no point in doing a shunt, this is not going to have this uh, little girl. I want to show you OMIM here. So this is OMIM and it stands for Online Millennial Inheritance in Man. And uh, there's some numbers but you can skip that. Let me. So one of the issues with OMIM is that uh, you have a lot of keywords. So if you skip. So if you type short limbs for instance you're going to have a lot of diagnosis. And this is, uh, if you add any keyword, it's automatically considered to be N. So, short limb and thumb was the same thing. Now, if you show short limbs, you know, with just the plural, you have even more diagnosis. Now, that doesn't tell you that these are baby with short limbs. It tells you that these are articles that have short and limbs. So you could have short limbs of bone and long limbs, you would be caught into that. So what you need to use is short limbs between quotation mark when you need to have the precise uh, translation. Let me skip that. Okay. Now when you when you do some search in, in uh, OMIM, you can find a connection to the right side. You see ER that that's of indisplasia. And when I go to the right side, you have gene tests. 
Any one of you has gone on the Dreamcast? So that's an important website, also covered by the NIH. And if you click here, you have a chapter on diastrophic despair, whatever condition it is. And these are very well written articles by very qualified people. And if you look into the table here, you have clinical testing, and you can say, okay, I am from this country, and or I'm from this state, and then you can find who is the physician working on the subject closest to you. So you have the email, you have the phone number. So when you're scanning a baby that has something unusual, you can say, okay, what kind of fluid do I have to give this person? Amitic fluid, whatever, and how many cc, and how long does it take to get the test, how much does it cost, so you can get some uh, very important diagnosis this way. Unfortunately, OMIM does not contain images. Now, if you look at the same box here, instead of clicking OMIM here, you can get PubMed. And PubMed is just a big database. I'm sure that you all know about that. Uh, so I'm going to skip this. The next one I wanted to show you is the one that is dear to my heart, is the fetus net. We started this in 1999 on paper, originally in 1991. And now we have actually about 75,000 images about 1,200 video clip and now 415 soft cases. There's a lot of material and you don't have to register, you don't have to pay subscription or nothing, uh, no sign in. And we get about five to 7,000 visitors per day from all over the world. And here on the left side we have the case of the week and on the right side we have the answer to the case of the week. Now we used to have a nicer system in which people could answer and then we would say, um, are you sure? Do you want to look at this a bit more? Or we would say, good idea, but not for it. And unfortunately, what happened is that there was a group of physicians that were cheating. They were sending one person at a time until they had a diagnosis, and then everyone was sending the correct diagnosis. So that's the reason we had to change. Uh, but you can still do that. So let me go back to putting it all together. And here, there's a basic level to have good scanning technique and equipment. So, is this a good NT scan? Yes, no? No, it's not a good NT scan because it's oblique. So, you have to have good scanning technique and good equipment. Then, the next thing is you have to recognize normal for normal. This is an 18 week exam. The whole exam is normal except for these two images here. And you see there is a small uh, enlargement of the lateral ventricle, and then what's wrong with this picture here? No nasal bone. Okay, no nasal bone and mild, you know, upper limit ventricular memory. How, how many of you suggest an amniocentesis? No amniocentesis? No one? One person. What's the diagnosis? So this baby has a combined trisomy 21 and chronic pelvic. The entire examination was normal except for the nasal board. And she was African American. So be careful, small findings are important. Two umbilical cord cysts. Which one is the umphalomesentric cyst and which one is the anentric cyst? How do you know? Well, go back to embryology. This is an A big embryo. You can see the connecting stove. And in the connecting stove, we have the mucular artery, umbilical vein. We have also the anentric duct. The anentric duct is the roof of the bladder going towards the uh, trophoblast. And then opposed to that, coming from the outside, we have the Wittlin duct that connects the yolk sac into the embryo. So now when you have this schematic in mind, it's very easy. If you have a, an enteric cyst, it's going to spread the vessels apart. If you have an unfamous enteric cyst, it's going to push the vessel together. This is called the diamond ring appearance. It looks like a ring with all the diamonds on the other side. So when you look at these two images now, it's very simple. This one is the omphalomocentric cyst, and this one is the anatomic cyst. So again, no natural anatomy and embryology is very important. And when I was a medical student, I hated both of them. So I now have the biggest, I used to have the biggest library of anatomy and embryology, but I gave it away. And then 
organize the findings. So here we have a baby that has a sinus and has big kidneys. You see the kidney here? 32 weeks. What is the size of the kidney at 32 weeks? The kidney, the cerebellum, the clavicle, and the foot are about a millimeter the same size of the gestational age. So for 32 weeks, it should be about 32 millimeters. It, it's not very precise, but this is just a simple rule of thumb. So here we have kidney that six or seven centimeters is too big. So we put this into uh, omium, and we have no answer because we put too many criteria. So let's try macrosomia and ascites. Nothing. Let's try ascites and infomegaly. Oh, now we have one here that says fetal gigantism. Well, fetal gigantism is the same thing as macrosomia. So now we can change the terminology and click on this, and here we have the permanent syndrome. So you see how by switching one keyword for another one and trying to get, you can get to the answer. Just give this one. So, in the middle level, what you want to do is associate some small finding. Here we have a skin tag in front of the ear, and when you see a skin tag in front of the ear, think about Golden Heart Syndrome. So, if you have 3D reconstruction, this is a good time to do a 3D scan of the face to see the hemifacial macrosomy. Now, do the jump to conclusion. Here we have an overriding aorta, and I don't know, I'm to show you the whole thing, but so you see overriding aorta, you think tetrahedral failure, but on the video clip, there was no pulmonary artery. So, this is pulmonary atresia with ventricular septal defect. This is another one that gives us a lot of trouble. This is a 35 week pregnancy. Fever is measured in 26 weeks, Eurus is measured in 23 weeks. You see the baby has a lot of soft tissue, so it's not uh, growth restricted. You see in the hand, there's a single palm crease here. In the other hand, there's another single palm crease. There's overlapping of the fifth finger over the forefinger, so the baby has clinodactyly. Kidney, 23 and 29 millimeter, that is too small for the five weeks. There's ventricular megaly, 14 millimeter. There is a downturn fish mouth with a corner of the mouth lower than the middle of the mouth, and there's a large atrioventricular septal defect. So, atrioventricular septal defect, short limbs, semen increase, um, uh, hydrocephalus, much diagnosis. Yeah, trying to make 21. I will be the, the most difficult. So, we do the amniocentesis, we send the report, we send the result and it comes back normal. So, what should we do now? What we should have done, we should have done from the onset, is go to OMIM and put all this keyword together, and when you go to OMIM, he comes with the Miami syndrome. So we should have taken a few more cc of amine fluid, asked for the metabolite or the cholesterol, and we would have the diagnosis. But I was so sure by looking the uh, uh, atrial central defect and the, the short limbs and the seam increase and the ventricular megaly. I was sure this was baby had trisomy 21. So I didn't do the mental effort to go to OMIM and I missed the diagnosis. Now, you know the proper vocabulary to search on the anomalies, I show you the body spur. And then at the advanced level, what you want to do is put together the findings and recognize the most discriminative. So, here we have a baby that has a cystic hygroma, it has some pleural effusion, it has a poorly coiled cord. What happened with the elbow here? No, it's a The skin is fine. This is called John Webbing. This is a very unusual keyword. So that's the one you want to use. What's happened with the face? How about the mouth? Macroplasia. No set ears, retro or verdant ears, okay? So we put this into OMIM, and OMIM doesn't talk about feel of them, so this is not a good choice. So John Webbing here has nine, the critical motion seven, we put them together, but 
or maybe doesn't work with previous. So that doesn't work. So what we need to do is something different. And then we're going to try now cystic hygroma and joint webbing. And when we do that, we get Noonan syndrome and Therigium coli syndrome. Now, Therigium coli is the word that the pediatrician are using. We use cystic hygroma, but the pediatrician are using Therigium coli. So we use now Therigium and joint webbing. And now we get the multiple Therigium, the Escobar variant, which is what this baby had. You see again, searching for some keyword and trying more and more. Now, if you don't admit findings, even if they appear impossible, these are conjoint twins. Can you have boys that are conjoint? Yeah, of course. Can you have two girls that are conjoint? Yeah, most conjoint twins are girls. Can you have a girl and a boy that are conjoint? That's it. This is a boy, this is a girl. How is that possible? Because you had, from the original cell mass, you had a loss of a Y chromosome. This was a 46XY chromosome. It turned into a heterogeneous conjoint twin. So once the line continues at 46XY, the boy, and the other cell line lose the Y chromosome, and now we have 45X0. A little term is So if you don't believe your ultrasound image, then you cannot get to the diagnosis. So you have to uh, always search for rare and unusual cases. So to sum up, your most basic function is to sort fetuses between those that will have no problem at birth, and these can be delivered in a small hospital far away, it doesn't matter those that will require intense scrutiny at birth, and those need to go to the big hospital where they can have pediatric cardiologists and they can have intensive care nursery, and those who will not survive, and there's no point in making you know, a lot of effort to try to save those babies. And the exact diagnosis is really the icing on the case. This is what makes prenatal diagnosis such a fun specialty, because you can anticipate rare anomaly like that conjoint twin. Thank you very much. And also thank you very much for having me in Azerbaijan. Uh, it has been a great treat for me and it has been thanks to the long amount of work from Azer. So thank you very, very much for having me and my wife.